Okay, well, well, thank you for the invitation. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, present. And uh, yeah, um, so I'm with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And just as a follow-up to uh, Joe's presentation, uh, I'd like to thank um, our uh, restoration group uh, in the Fish and Wildlife. We, we were kind of uh, early adopters to the uh, process-based restoration. Uh, we've been following Joe's uh, really, you know, practical and applied research for the last 10 years. And uh, what I'm going to show you here at Doty Ravine Creek is a location where we just kind of jumped in head first uh, to, to really uh, try and apply this um, hey, uh, restoration approach. Yeah. You have uh, your, you might want to change your settings because you've got next slide is visible uh, in your, um, in your presentation. Oh. Is that better? No, there we go. Yes, that works. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we really jumped in head first on, on this uh, process-based restoration approach at this Doty Ravine site. And I wanna acknowledge uh, my colleagues, um, Jared McKee, who's a civil engineer with US Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the whole uh, uh, group at uh, Placer Land Trust that work with us on their property to implement this project. Uh, so I work for the Partners for Fish and Wildlife. We provide technical and funding assistance to private landowners to implement habitat restoration. Um, we, uh, we, we do all types of upland to wetland to river and stream restoration. Um, for this presentation, I'm really going to focus on our stream restoration efforts. I've mostly been involved with stream and river design for the, over a decade with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And you know we're 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 having some attitude shifts, some some uh, philosophy and and just technical approach shifts that have occurred over the last five to ten years. And I want to talk about some of those new approaches we're taking uh, to working with streams, stream process uh, that we're you know uh, objectives that we're we're integrating with our with our restoration projects, and uh, and how we're integrating. Um, uh, the uh, management on these sites with uh, more dynamic uh, flooding uh, systems and integrating uh, private landowner management in terms of cattle operations and infrastructure. Um, so I'll start, this is, uh, this was Doty Ravine. This is the valley bottom uh, at the site. Uh, and as you can see, it's pretty standard um, dry disconnected valley bottom floodplain delineated by the yellow lines here. And you can see we just have a single thread channel. This has been um, you know, a single thread for well over a century. And uh, we started originally by actually fencing the cattle out of this channel uh, at this site. But then we moved on to actually restoring the valley bottom connectivity. And as we can see, once we do that, we get this really huge increase in productivity and channel and habitat. And on this site, um, we were just blown away within two years, the increase in migratory birds, I mean, magnitude increases uh, in, in also in uh, productivity of fish out on the floodplain. But, you know, that's great. Our, our key question, we learn, we, we work with private landowners. So, um, we want to do this because we know it works, but we, is it compatible uh, with, with the management? Is it compatible with cattle? These are the key design questions that we face on, on every project that we go into. Um, so, you know, a, a, key, a key goal here with, with what we're doing, uh, we want to increase production of fish, of migratory birds, of of amphibians and other sensitive species. And the key to that a lot of times is increasing connectivity on these sites. And this is an example from the Yellow Bypass. You can see where you have uh, salmonids that are uh, raised in the drainage canal or in the Sacramento River. They're much smaller than those um, that are uh, rearing out on these reconnected floodplains. And that's because what, what's happening out on that floodplain is that once it's reconnected, uh, we're getting these processes that are restored, geomorphic process, 
new channels are being, are being carved, deposition is going on. And then in the summertime, you get, you get uh, plant growth on these surfaces and just an increase in, in biodiversity within these systems. Oh, sorry. And so another, another process too uh, that we're looking at, um, that we're focusing on is, is channel migration. We want to see channels move. Um, and we've spent, uh, you know, as a channel, this is the Truckee River. And on the right side of the photo there is, is a slightly uh, somewhat eroding bank. And on the left side, you see deposition. And along with that deposition, you see uh, vegetation change. And so we get more diversity as these channels are more mobile. But we have a long history uh, within our program and, and just in restoration and focusing on stabilizing uh, channels. Um, and, and in this sense, we're, we're really fighting a uh, natural process and we're investing a lot of money in it too. Here we're, we're building a, a rock J hook to prevent erosion of a bank. And this was pretty traditional um, uh, standard stream channel restoration, at least in our program. And, you know, we looked at what we were doing. We were spending a lot of our budget just simply on moving a lot of rock, spending a lot of our budget on, on, on just diesel for, for moving streams, reconstructing channels, and overall just trying to stabilize uh, the stream system, which may be a goal. Um, but is it getting at our, our overall goal? Are we getting more ducks and fatter salmon because we're putting rocks in the water? Well, the research isn't showing us that. And so um, that's where, you know, really working with these processes in these valley bottoms come, comes into play. And, you know, in somewhat similar um, situation with incised channels, uh, this is an incised channel that had been fenced um, from cattle for a number of years but it's still an incised channel. Uh, now it does have a lot of vegetation growth. Um, so simply just fencing these channels while in themselves are not, I wouldn't say they're bad projects, they're, they're not always an end goal for what we want um, in terms of restoration implementation within a valley bottom. Um, and so when we're doing a restoration project, uh, we wanna take an overall look, take a look at the valley, at the catchment, and really try and identify source problems within these systems, disconnectivities. Um, and in this case, uh, we have a road network that was the uh, source problem for causing this incision. So if we just simply um, try and keep cattle out of the channel, that doesn't really get at our, our uh, source problem here. And I'll show one example here of, uh, this is Sequoia National Park where they replaced a uh, culvert and road crossing with this uh, causeway. And this is another example of good infrastructure project, benefits to the public, benefits to uh, the landowner, and also benefits to uh, the resource. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing uh, these infrastructure projects up uh, because you know they're part of the whole package. There's no like silver bullet here. Um, with, with uh, the way we approach these projects. Um, and, and that's, you know, uh, the beaver are teaching us a ton about how to work with the stream system. But before I move on to the beaver, I just wanted to emphasize that we're, we're you know, we're looking at the catchment for other potential problems because the more we can address these source problems in the system, the more process we're gonna have to work with. And, um, so moving on to uh, the beaver part of it, um, you know, from our standpoint, obviously the, the important component is that they build these dams and, and they really do increase the, the valley bottom connectivity of the fluvial system and uh, give us a number of benefits as, as Joe pointed out, the uh, uh, water storage, uh, fire resiliency benefits that we're seeing um, a number of researchers come out with. Uh, from our standpoint, the habitat for migratory birds and other sensitive species. Um, many of our sensitive fishery species as well. So, uh, you know, from a as a as a stream restoration designer, I'm I'm also interested. How do they do this? They're so small. 
And yet, you know, here we are with giant bulldozers and rocks and, uh, you know, and we're still struggling to figure out how to, how to restore these systems, yet they're this kind of like 40 pound little creature just uh, carrying around twigs and sticks and they're able to influence these systems. And what I have up here is a diagram of the, the stream channel evolution model. And I really just want to point out two things here. Most of our systems are pretty degraded. There are these simple single, single channel um, stream systems that are uh, deep and incised. Well, beaver um, can, can really accelerate uh, the restoration of these systems back to these stage zero or multi-channel systems. And, and they, they, kind of, they kind of skip or short circuit the entire evolutionary uh, uh, pathway here in some cases, you know, shortening the, the, the time span that it takes to restore these systems by decades in, in many cases. And, you know, why are they doing that? Well, they're capitalizing on, on the productivity of the system. They know that, that a system this simple is not productive. Um, when you get up and you reconnect the valley bottom, you increase plant growth, you increase habitat complexity, and overall better um, productivity for, for their needs and for the needs of many of our other uh, species. And so, uh, you know, we, we started using the uh, process-based restoration approaches Joe had mentioned uh, and described uh, in his presentation. And here we are just um, adding uh, uh, two and a half inch diameter posts to an existing dam um, and then we see during high flow events, you know, this flow is going out onto the floodplain and we're really able to use this flood energy. And in this, in this case, this is Doty Ravine Creek and a two year flood event in this system, a 24 hour two year flood event is equivalent to 21 backhoe days of, of energy or diesel use. So in other words, that's how much work we're getting in, term, in terms of channel uh, construction, new channel construction out on that floodplain. We're not paying for it. In fact, right now with this big storm, we're getting a ton of work being done for us right now. And not only are we not paying for the construction, we're not paying for the design either. Uh, it's, it's really self uh, system design. And, you know, here's what I'm talking about. In year two, we uh, reconnected to the floodplain surface. You start to see deposition. By year three, we have a, a permanent channel developing. And this is an example of where we're using these structures. Sometimes we, we don't necessarily want deposition. This is a really deep in size channel where we want, to, we want to widen the channel. And so we're building a constriction dam to kind of blast out some of the trees, get them into the channel. And over time, uh, that channel comes up and reconnects to the floodplain here. Uh, here's an example in the uh, uh, floodplain, or I'm sorry, in, uh, here we have the original incised channel. We removed some levee. Year one, we built a BDA and it, um, it routed and formed a meander around the BDA. Year two, we extended, we extended the, uh, the structure out. And, uh, and we get full connectivity to the floodplain. By year three, we have a new channel forming out on the floodplain. And so these structures are built over time. Um, and, you know, we don't, uh, they're, they're kind of grown over time, I guess you could say. So it's important to consider that, that uh, multi-year construction period uh, for, for many sites if, if you're looking at this approach. Uh, so now I'll just move on to more specific at Doty Ravine. Uh, it's owned by Placer Land Trust, located in the uh, Sierra foothills, uh, just, just north of the town of Lincoln, California. And 427 total acres, floodplains about 55 acres. And uh, it's grazed. Um, it's in a smaller, uh, smaller watershed. Uh, and we have, uh, we're, it's grazed with a herd size of about 60 head. And, um, and there you get a uh, kind of a bird's eye view there, aerial view of the uh, property, the uplands, 
in brown during the summer, and you can see the uh, reconnected floodplain um, during the summer is, is mostly the reconnected floodplain at the valley bottom there. And so when I, when I first started uh, with the Doty Ravine project, I was originally invited out um, to the site for concerns of eroding uh, bank areas uh, that were you know, just sloughing off into the water. Uh, and we had this single thread channel uh, along this kind of disconnected floodplain where there were some attempts to plant oaks. It was so dry out in this floodplain. And so that was around when we started looking at the process-based restoration approaches. Um, uh, this gives you just the LIDAR view so you can see how, how flat that, that land is and how in size this channel was as well. And so we looked at what are the problems? You know, originally our, our uh, you know, historically maybe we would have gone in and just tried to uh, stabilize this bank. But when we take a process approach, we're looking at, okay, what can we change in terms of management to allow natural processes to, to restore this system? And number one, we stopped killing the beaver on the site uh, because beaver were eating a lot of the uh, oak trees that were being planted, um, or well, they were knocking a lot of them down in the floodplain. Uh, we needed to address the channel incision and we needed to remove a few uh, levee areas. And once we did that, we got a pretty, pretty quick reconnection of this uh, valley bottom floodplain. And so here's just another view of just how desiccated, uh, you know, these uh, valley bottoms are in the summertime when, you know, it would be kind of hard to even, without really looking at the geomorphic uh, aspects of this closely, you'd think that it probably is oak savanna in, in that valley bottom and not a um, you know, potential uh, valley bottom uh, uh, stream, multi-channel stream. So just to look at some, uh, uh, just some summary uh, uh, results from this project, we converted about 50 acres of floodplain uh, to uh, valley bottom wetland. We saw vegetation changes from grass, blackberry, and star thistle to wetland vegetation and uh, riparian forest. We see fully uh, uh, activated floodplain during base flow conditions. And, um, and, and we still have cattle using uh, the uh, valley bottom for water grazing and crossing to other pastures. Uh, here's, here's an example of the water. Uh, well, here are the cattle in the uplands. Here's kind of some of the lower uh, beaver wetland area. Uh, this is a, uh, an example um, uh, access point we have to the valley bottom so that they do have access to water, uh, constant access to water. And then uh, I was just going to show some Let's see how this video is going to work here. Uh, let's see. Okay, come on. So this is just an example of the cattle access to the valley bottom after it's been reconnected. Um, and I'm, I'm fast forwarding here, but this is a bunch of primrose that is kind of an invasive and, and has grown uh, in places. And, you know, the cattle are uh, we, we do allow, they're allowed in for at least a few days at a time. And in this case, you know, they're coming in. Uh, we're seeing a number of migratory birds, but also the, the cattle in this case came in. They, they're, um, you know, they're opening up pockets of, of this primrose uh, at the valley bottom, uh, which is good for, in terms of, you know, adding some diversity to the vegetation structure, opening up ponded areas uh, where you, you have really dense growth of this stuff. Okay, let's see, can I... Okay, so, um, so just to give you an overview of how we plan these projects, uh, 
and, and Joe got into this a little bit, you know, we'll look at a site. This is the Doty Ravine aerial uh, with the LIDAR um, image. Uh, and you can see that thin blue line was the original uh, flow path and channel area. And then the yellow line represents the um, potential for where we could restore fluvial dynamics out to that, that yellow area. And eventually that's, a, that's where we um, placed our riparian fencing is out along that geomorphic uh, kind of barrier along there. Well, not exactly, but, but it followed that somewhat. And so then, you know, our, our goal is to figure out not so much what the stream, um, exactly what the stream is gonna do, but we wanna know what are the limitations from the landowner? Where can't we reactivate? And that's the exercise we go through. And on this site, you'll notice we still had this um, small area here that we had to protect. But over time, we, we figured out we could reconnect a lot of this uh, valley bottom space through levee removal, through uh, grading the incised channel, and working with uh, the beaver on the site. And uh, here's just a view of the aerial. And you can see that we still have, um, we still have some dry area. So there's, there's an area here where the cattle still cross from the north uh, to south pasture. So I'm gonna summary um, graph here, but before I do that, I know we usually see um, beaver felling trees, but I wanted to show a video of a beaver falling out of a tree. You don't see every day, but uh, that was um, that was collected by my uh, colleague Jared McKee, uh, and so that was that was about the rarest footage I've ever seen beaver falling out of a tree. So beware, look up when you're out there. You never know. Uh, so um, yeah, so what what I have here, I wanted to show a summary. Uh, number one. You see the first um, the first few years, the first four or five years of this project, there was a lot of money spent on a constructed wetland and on tree planting, but we didn't have we didn't get the the, the uh, benefits in terms of aquatic restoring aquatic habitat on this system uh, during these first few years. We spent about one hundred and sixty thousand and built a tiny little wetland on the site. And, and really spent a lot of money protecting trees. Um, then we, we uh, turned to this process-based approach and we ended up spending about 58,000 and we reconnected the valley bottom. And, and it's, it, it was then that we really saw these huge benefits and returns on migratory birds, you know, increasing the magnitude of migratory birds. We barely saw wood ducks out there. Now we see hundreds of them. Uh, we saw salmon out there for the first time and, you know, increasing, uh, tremendous increase in channel length uh, and all while continuing to, um, uh, you know, continuing the grazing operation. So that, uh, that concludes things here. I want to leave my contact information. Um, we'd love to uh, work with anybody that's interested in, in uh, you know, just if you have questions or if you have land where you, you might be interested in some type of valley bottom project like this, uh, we can certainly uh, take a look anytime. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Thank you very much, Damien. Uh, could you type your questions in the chat? Um, and I'll direct Damien to the chat to see if there's any questions for you. Also want to remind you in the chat, there are uh, web linkages to uh, the photo contest, People's Choice photo contest, and also to uh, sign up for the, the rangeland linkages of CRCC's newsletter. And also want to encourage people to uh, stay with us to the end uh, to be participatory in these, um, in our discussion groups. There are a couple of questions that, that we've posed and uh, we put you all in, in a group uh, with a moderator. So if you could stay with us, uh, it would be really appreciated. 
Did we get any questions for Damien? Oh, yeah, I was typing an answer to one. Uh, should I? Would you go ahead and answer? I, go ahead and select one and answer it. Yeah, the first question was, um, uh, where where was the, the uh, oh, the fire example in California you showed with the beaver dam. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that was in California. Um, I'd have to take a look at that paper. Uh, I'll have to get back, I'll have to get back on that one. Um, and can you speak to Ken's comment on your experience with working with tribes? Uh, yeah, so we, we are um, working with uh, quite a few tribes in California and Nevada with uh, process-based restoration approaches. Um, uh, the uh, Mountain Maidu tribe has recently acquired a uh, large meadow, which formerly known as Humbug Valley, now Tasman Koyam. Uh, and that, uh, that's actually our largest uh, process-based meadow project uh, that we have now is that collaboration with the uh, Maidu uh, on, that, on that project. You have a question from Sarah Westfall. Uh, do you work with Army Corps regarding flood control dams? Uh, not directly regarding flood control dams. Uh, certainly consider other infrastructure when we're designing projects, uh, but uh, no, I, I haven't coordinated on, specifically on, on, you know, with, with Army Corps on, on dams. But be interested to know what, maybe, you know, what, what opportunities there are there. And, and not, um, and then finally, uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, there's a request to see the beaver falling in the tree again, falling from the tree again. Oh, you know what? You can uh, you can see that on YouTube, I believe. Uh, yeah, that that one. Uh, oh, but uh, yeah, I can certainly play it again. Uh, or uh, <laughs> you can put the link up in the chat, Damien. Okay, yeah. I'll do that. I'll, I'll put the YouTube link up. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Damien. Really appreciate it.